Danke, ich begrüße alle zu unserer Runde. Ich freue mich, dass ich Sie sozusagen einleiten darf. How Radical are Open Access and the Digital Humanities ist das Thema. Ich bin Petra Sitte, ich bin Bundestagsabgeordnete, ich bin bei den Linken und befasse mich seit vielen Jahren mit Forschungs- und Netzpolitik. Und die Linke präsentiert in dieser Diskussionsrunde eigentlich zwei Schokoladenthemen, mit denen ich mich beschäftige. Das eine ist Chancen der Digitalisierung für das Wissen von morgen. Finde ich extrem spannend. Und zum anderen eben auch die Frage zu diskutieren, wie unabhängige und kritische Wissenschaft als Gegenentwurf zum heutigen Forschungsbetrieb mit seinen befristeten Projekten und künstlichen Förderwettbewerben aussehen kann. Das sind also die beiden Themen, die hier diskutiert werden sollen. Darüber hinaus freut mich ganz ausgesprochen, dass ich selber Mercedes Bunz mit ankündigen kann. Sie ist ja sozusagen als digitale Vordenkerin unterwegs, hat mehrere Veröffentlichungen gemacht. Sie promovierte zur Geschichte des Internets, war Chefredakteurin des Tagesspiegels Online und ist derzeit Technologiereporterin des Guardian, forscht auch noch, das kann sie ja vielleicht irgendwann selber fallen lassen, worüber. Und ich selber habe mit großem Vergnügen gerade erst kürzlich in der elektronischen Variante das Buch von ihr Die stille Revolution gelesen und habe da viel mitgenommen, sehr zu empfehlen. Sie wird zu den eben benannten Themen diskutieren, sozusagen aus internationaler Brille mit Nishan Cha, Forschungsdirektor am Center for Internet and Society im indischen Bangalore. David Barry, kommt ihr jetzt langsam? Bitte schon hoch. Sonst stelle ich hier sozusagen virtuell nur etwas vor. Also Nishan Shah, Forschungsdirektor am Center for Internet and Society im indischen Bangalore. Dann David Barry, Associate Professor für Digital Media im Institut für Politik und Kulturwissenschaften der Universität Swansea, Wales. Und zuletzt noch Cornelius Puschmann, wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter des Instituts für Bibliotheks- und Informationswissenschaft sowie des Instituts für Internet und Gesellschaft an der Humboldt-Universität. Wir haben schwere Konkurrenz, wie ihr ja sicher gesehen habt, an der Tagesordnung. Aber ich glaube, das wird trotzdem spannend und sehr anregend. So, dann viel Spaß. Ach ja. Hello, thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, Technic people over there. Um, could you maybe um, lighten up the audience a bit? Because um, it's very good if we can see them a bit better so that we get if you are bored or if you have a question or anything. And I think that it's in general a bit better for the introduction. And we are a little bit uh, blinded by the lights here at the moment. Um, I'm very happy that so many of you came over here to discuss open access and the digital humanities. Um, with us today. Um, I have to say, since uh, about half a year, I am um, heading a team at Leuphana University um, about hybrid publishing that looks into open access and how open access changes the publishing sphere and the academic communication in general. Now, the interesting thing is, I don't know, some of you might know my background is newspaper journalism and um, there for a very long time we had this discussion shall we go digital is it bad will newspapers die and in the interesting thing is in uh, well in the academic sphere you don't have this discussion um, the UK has clearly decided that research that is funded should be published open access the EU is about to follow um, with a horizon 2020 program to push everyone into open access And um, we've seen the landscape change a lot in the couple, last couple of years, or even months, I would say. And the interesting thing for me is, um, since I've started um, looking into open access, um, my own opinion is constantly transforming. So this is one question that we have here today. Now, when I started, we, or in the beginning, we all considered open and digital as the new good things, while closed was bad. But now I think things seem to be a little bit more complicated. Um, I also want to say that I would like to um, dedicate this panel a little bit to Aaron Schwartz. Um, the digital community has talked a lot about his death. Um, he died on January 11th this year and committed suicide and over his head was this word of Damocles in form of a lawsuit that threatened him with 
dozens of years in prison and a one million dollar fine. Um, and what he did was he downloaded millions of documents from Gistor, I think you pronounce it, a not-for-profit company that provides searchable digitized copies for academic journals. Um, so I think this is a good moment to mention that and that what he was after is not forgotten and will continue. And with me, um, next to me. Next to me, um, we have Cornelius Pushman, David, Barry, and Nishan Shah. And I would like to ask Nishan the first question. Um, each of us will talk a little bit, and um, we try to take you along and explain a bit what is open access, what is digital humanities, but at the same time try to go and push the discussion further. And if you want to comment, please raise your uh, arms. Um, so what we are going to discuss, and um, before I give uh, the word over to Nishant, I'll again pose the questions. What is open access, and has it been co-opted by capitalistic interests? What are the digital humanities and do they represent the creep of capitalistic interests into the academy? And how can we return to the radicalism of the early movements? Nishant, um, the idea of open, we talked a lot about it. Um, Nishant's also at the Lafana University uh, and you bring uh, examples from India a lot and please can you take everybody along? What could be the idea of open? Yes, thank you. Um, so. I need to make a qualification that everything I speak comes from a particular context called India. Uh, but in India, we have this very arrogant way of thinking that when we speak about India, we think that it's the rest of the world. Um, so feel free to translate it into your own context and see what comes out of it, right? Um, as Mercedes says, there is this really strange trajectory around openness, because for all of us who were really, really excited that things should become open because things should be free because we live in a free world, there was a very quick realization that, that things are not that easy, right? Um, and let's, let's speak with two particular kinds of openness, which might be interesting to open up ideas around talking about openness, maybe. And the first is the notion of open data. Um, I'm almost sure that everybody in the room agrees with me with different variations that open data is a good thing, right? That because we have an idea that data is closed and data needs to be opened up, and that it's something we all commonly share between us. I think one of the basic presumptions to that is that data is not natural. We have this very clear understanding that data is a man-made, human-made, woman-made, cyborg-made fabrication, which then is distributed, stored, accessed by, and so on and so forth by different people. And that people who always want access to that information don't necessarily have it. We also have a presumption um, that it is often the people who are on the fringes of the society. So if you start looking at the ways in which India is structuring itself right now, we have this incredible document called Vision 2020, um, which says that by 2020, India needs to become a smart state. And smart works out for sm simple, moral, accountable, responsible, and transparent. It's beautiful how acronyms work out, right? Um, so India wants to become a smart state by 2020. And one of the ways by which it has to do this is by making its data streams available to farmers who are committing suicide in the country. Um, at the rate that India right now has a recorded rate of 18 farmer suicides a day, and one of the key problems recognized by digital humanities and new kinds of data informatics is that farmers are not empowered in the information age. Farmers do not have access to state resources because they do not know how to navigate information ecologies. And farmers are basically killing themselves because we need more data for them. When you make such a persuasive argument, you say, yeah, sure, all data should be open and should be made available to the farmers at any given point of time. And so you have massive billion dollar uh, projects which are set up with uh, you know, a lot of different collaborators, including the private players and so on. Uh, and I don't know if you've been following the debates which have been happening in India recently, but the CEO of Nestle uh, recently suggested that water is not a fundamental right, and so it can be privatized and bottled and sold and nobody should interfere with it. Thankfully, the United Nations did interfere with it and said water is a fundamental right, and so water should be an open commodity. Yeah? And we are moving in an information age where we are suggesting that maybe data is also a fundamental right. And that data is something that should be talked about in terms of openness. 
And then the openness kind of comes up in all different forms. It comes up in open access and open knowledge and open formats and hardware and software. And these are all a part of questions. My proposition to the enthusiasts of openness is always to be slightly cautious about what I am calling the politics of the benign. There is this politics which suggests that everything open is necessarily good in nature. Yeah? And so we should definitely open up everything that we can. And the only, only cautionary tale I might have to tell is to perhaps replace the word data within the open data rubric with people and start thinking about what would open people look like. Yeah? And, and, and it's, it's a tricky proposition, because the minute you talk about open people, you will immediately start thinking of questions around privacy, and security, and safety, and dignity, and life, and so on and so forth. I think the separation between data and people has forced us to believe that everything open is good, but it is a real fact that openness needs to be treated with caution that politics of the benign that operates around data needs to disappear simply because we need to start thinking about questions of accountability, limitations, and usability of data when we talk about open data. Because we live in data reality worlds. The data is not just abstraction of some sort, data is about people. And that maybe when we start talking about open data and digital humanities, we need to stop thinking and fetishizing this, this idea of information and data and start thinking about open data slash people. And what are the social and political implications which happen because we open up certain kinds of data sets which can sometimes put people in conditions of great danger and precarity in contexts that we might not be familiar with. So I'll stop here and hope that maybe we'll complicate this picture later on and I can tell you more stories from there. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. I think um, um, your um, sort of equation between open data and open people already made very good clear that there's a sort of a problem out there um, we uh, are interested in. Um, Cornelius, you, um, your research goes about academic blocks uh, in the past and, and science blocks and how academic communication changes. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask you the question, is there a new public out there for the humanities? Uh, what have you found? Um, oh, this is loud. So, uh, scholarly blogging and the uptake generally of social media in um, the academy or among scientists and scholars is um, uh, has generally been very lagging or very slow in, in terms of quantitative adoption. So there, there hasn't been a widespread interest in using blogs and social media to communicate um, uh, either to, with the public or uh, internally inside of disciplines beyond certain pockets of adoption that you have, for example, in the digital humanities. Um, but uh, as a sort of a mass movement, there hasn't really been a broad embrace of social media to talk about uh, scholarly issues, to reach out to the public. There are, there are individuals who do this, but the, the majority of researchers are not really um, very engaged in this. And I think the reason is, and this is, I think, a, a discussion that will sort of uh, keep having when we're talking about open access and digital humanities, we sort of have to disentangle the brands from, from the, the actual uh, communities or practitioners or people engaging or identifying with these, these notions. So I think something like digital humanities to people um, who, who uh, have perhaps studied a, a humanities subject sounds really sort of, oh, it's digital and it's humanities, that sounds really sort of cool or interesting. But if you look, um, and that's not to say that actual digital humanists don't do cool or interesting things, and that's also, of course, a, a matter of perspective, but um, the actual communities, some of the actual communities of digital humanists that I've met who identified with this brand actually had fairly traditional objects of research. They were interested in, in um, very traditional cultural um, artifacts, historical artifacts, and studying those through digital representations or through digital media. But that means if you're, a, uh, say, a historical linguist studying, uh, I don't know, Egyptian uh, script or something like that, then you use computational tools to do this analysis. But you're not really, you know, you're not, you're not necessarily likely to be at a conference like this. I mean, not necessarily. So that's, there's a discrepancy, at least in my experience, sometimes between what we associate with these terms, uh, perhaps as, as um, I wouldn't say as outsiders, but uh, as people who are not necessarily engaged in these movements, our expectation towards what digital humanities 
could look like and the actual, what people actually do who are, who are doing these kinds of things. But this is, this is very, very sort of a, a uneven and a very mixed, mixed bag. But um, referring that for a second to, to open access also, um, if, if I may, um, my experience with open access has always been that there's a discrepancy between what people associated with it. If you ask somebody on the street, what do you think about open access, then they have a sort of very broad notion of, of openness uh, in relation to open access. But if you go to an open access conference where there's library and, and information science people or library people and publishers and maybe people from the political uh, um, arena, th it's a very technical issue. It's something that's very, it, it has certain legal um, uh, qualities attached to it. So there's a very s specific notion of openness. It's not, I was at, a, at an open access conference once and there was a person um, representing um, a large scholar society and she was asked what do you think about open access and do you does your large um, uh, scholarly society uh, engage in open access and this was in the early 2000s when when the whole thing was not quite as as uh, widely discussed and and she was sort of not an expert necessarily and she was on this panel and responded to this question by saying yes we our society um, uh, we do open access when people ask us um, for the um, um, articles from the journals that we publish we send them to people so we're doing open access right but that's not open access in the in the sense of um, what the EU has in mind or what what other uh, policymakers have in mind so yeah so I'm, I'm saying the, the labels um, differ very much and the, the um, uh, uh, the expectation that that because it's possible to use blogs or to use social media this is something that will um, sort of be embraced by scholars um, that's that's not been my experience because it doesn't necessarily fit into um, into established patterns of doing things into um, well, some of that is, is in, the, in the question you raised before, the um, question of uh, what the expectations are towards, towards scholars in general in the relation to, to uh, the public. Uh, is, is it the job of scholars necessarily to reach out to the public with, uh, with what they do? And I think yeah. there are some people who don't necessarily have that, have that viewpoint. Yeah, that, that's an important point. Maybe just to take everybody of you along, um, Open access, I'll quickly explain mm -hmm. it, is that, um, that um, your research that is, has a national funding or, an, or a government funding is published um, open, accessible, and not in a journal where you have to subscribe to it. Now, the thing in the past was that uh, with certain academic journals, uh, the subscription was really horrible high uh, and the u universities were forced to pay twice. They pay once for the researcher and they pay the wage for the researcher. And then the actual research that is produced in the universities with the government funding, because the universities are government funded still, and that's very good, I think. Um, this research that is produced is then published in with commercial publishers that then uh, ask the libraries of the universities for subscription fees so that the universities have to pay twice, they pay the wage and then they have to buy in the research that's actually produced in their own universities for a lot of times. And of course, in the digital age, this all started to disrupt, fall apart. And, and at the moment, people are talking about two different models of open access. There is gold, there's green. I know there's also blue and other colors around, but these are the most discussed ones. And gold is that it, uh, it is accessible, that it's published open, that everybody can download it. And green is that you can put it in your own personal repository. Um, I think uh, you can always go there in further details, but just to give you a, a rough idea. And with this, uh, something interesting happened that the public's really changed um, and what Cornelius was just talking about. Um, Open access, it, the US, for example, just embraced it. It is, in general, re embraced by most governments by now. Uh, and uh, they, uh, um, in America, it's very interesting because there's a very strong force behind it. I think it's called We the People or something. It is taxpayers that say, we pay for the research and we want to have access for the research. And this is a bit crucial if you are a scientist, you know, I don't know how many scientists are among us, if you are an academic or scientist, if you are a humanities scholar, you know that we talk nerd language, we talk to each other, we drop names nobody else can understand. And that's a big problem now that comes up um, for uh, in academia. Now with open access, 
there comes a little bit the thinking that everybody should understand what you are talking about. And this is a problem I think we will get back to later. Before, I would like to give David uh, a chance to explain for, uh, to us. Um, there is not only open access, there's at the moment a, a big push um, that uh, is um, yeah, happening in the universities with the digitalization. It's not only publishing. And one part of the university that was always reflective or critical about what's happening in our societies was the humanities. And we uh, have digital humanities, Cornelius already mentioned it. And or what interests me is David is an expert on it. He published a book called Understanding Digital Humanities. A uh, very good introduction, who of you is interested, I could uh, recommend it. Um, can you explain what are the digital humanities and why does this question of radicalism comes up there so strongly? So uh, firstly, obviously, I have to apologize to any digital humanists because I have to give quite a broad brush uh, <laughs> overview of what the digital humanities is. And I think first, um, uh, firstly, I think we can say, you know, uh, in a very outline sense, the digital humanities are the application of computational principles and computational methods to what has been, you know, traditionally thought of as uh, very scholarly, close reading, textual work in the main. So the digital humanities have been very much about embracing these kinds of digital methods, digital solutions, digital technologies more generally, in order to kind of raise new research questions, check and you know, critique older research positions, and so on and so forth. But within the digital humanities, it's a new field, if I could call it a field, that is itself quite contested. But the digital humanities itself is a very contested area. Uh, there's a lot of discussion. Um, well worth uh, visiting some of the research blogs of some of the participants to see how, in some senses, a field develops. It's very interesting to watch how different players, as a kind of Anglo-American digital humanities, some think there's a particularly American digital humanities, there's a more European digital humanities. And it's interesting to see how the definition is being uh, created online. So it's, a, it's an interesting moment of uh, uh, field formation in many ways. So the kinds of things that the digital humanities have uh, traditionally been involved in, I mean, it, it's not as new as it seems, although the term digital humanities uh, dates to something like 2001, the principles of using some kind of computation go back to sort of the 1940s. Um, and this kind of played out, particularly in the universities, in the sense of a kind of service or technical capacities. You'd have departments who would offer computing support, essentially, to humanist scholars who wanted to use uh, computer techniques and computational methods. This uh, was christened uh, humanities computing and was thought to somehow be a bit old-fashioned and sounded a bit like a service department. So there was a, a lot of discussion in the uh, 2000s about, you know, how could we make it refreshed and, you know, sound relevant, etc. And the term digital humanities kind of came to the fore. And this is interesting in itself, you know, why digital humanities and not computational humanities, for example. Because it's in the social sciences, for example, there has been uh, the term computational social science. So that's, that's very interesting. So, early digital humanities tended to focus very much upon uh, digitization. There was lots of archives, lots of texts, lots of imagery that was placed online. There was a, a lot of talk about creating not comprehensive archives, but exhaustive archives, right? Because the digital allowed you to have everything. And there was a, a big push towards these kind of giant databases and archives, and there wasn't much thought about what would be done with them. It was, you know, self-evident that digitizing stuff was cool. Um, a good example of this is the Newton Project at the University of Sussex. They've got a, an amazing uh, archive of Isaac Newton's work, and it is literally comprehensive and exhaustive in, in ways that are, I think, really interesting. The second kind of wave of digital humanities was about a focus on born digital content, so rather than physical uh, things being you know, translated over into the digital realm, we had a lot more digital archives, and the, all the new digital objects then became a kind of site of uh, interest. And I think the, the more recent turn is really towards the notion of, uh, you know, medium and the questions of the digital itself and how the digital shapes, you know, the, the humanities themselves. Um, so some of the discussions that go on within digital humanities and to kind of position it within this panel, really, 
and again, this is a simplification, only pulling out four strands, but open access is, again, something that continues to be contested within the digital humanities. Mm. And the digital itself, I think, raises these questions in interesting ways, partly, I think, because of the libertarian push towards information needs to be free. So I think that's part of that, that uh, lineage there. But there are also, of course, uh, democratic questions raised by it. The second thing is this kind of early adopter digital technology strand. There's a very strong technicist uh, kind of, I suppose what uh, Evgeny Morozov might call solutionism, hmm. but this notion that the, you know, the, the digital for the digital, for digital sake is a good thing, okay? not necessarily critically considered. There's an interesting discussion um, in terms of you know, close readings, uh, very small focuses, so for example, you know, looking at a novel or looking at a, a set of novels, maybe four or five, and the digital humanities allows, for example, the possibility of studying 45 million novels. And you can imagine that sense of scale really does create interesting questions and problematics for what the humanities traditionally are. And lastly, I want to finish on the kind of catchphrase that has been associated very much with the digital humanities, and that's uh, more hack, less yak. Right? Which is an interesting term, really, because in many ways it, it, it talks about less theory, less considerations of theory, and more programming, more coding, more making and building things. And this, again, is very interesting because it kind of reflects on the kinds of activities that digital humanists have got involved in. There's been a lot of focus on programming and code literacy and open access because I think of that framing of the discussion. But I'll, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, what um, I would like to explain quickly how I think, um, because it might be a bit abstract, how open access and digital humanities then cross, because what we see here is um, in open access, I mean, we, it's not just open access, but in general, since we uh, live in the digital, we publish things sooner, faster, and uh, many more things, and whoever does research knows um, that this also means you have to read more things and have to know more about things. And now we might need in the future uh, tools like um, that, that are explored at the moment in the digital humanities to actually work with a lot of texts. Um, because what we can say is that um, um, one colleague of mine once called it that uh, we start to live in an age where science as a stream um, is the case actually. Um, we talked this morning about it that uh, by now I think every journal article is, cited, is quoted for about four years and not after, uh, and after four years it's sort of forgotten. Um, and this is quite something interesting that it's in the back of open access, it's not just, um, it is a movement to, to speed up science that is all connected to each other. And the interesting thing is that by now um, I think we are, like I'm personally um, still on the side that I think open access is a good thing. At the Lausanne University, we are about to publish, a, to, to uh, start a university project, a university press that will be open access, the Center for Digital Culture Press. Um, and I think it allows a lot of things, but I also see that there is a downturn. Um, you just made some notes of open access. Um, I saw uh, on the corner of my, do you like, would you like to share them? Um, I think they fit in here good. Um, I was just very amused at our panel because um, I don't think we agree on what openness or open access might possibly mean, which is possibly a good thing because it's symptomatic of how the entire field seems to operate. Um, simply because uh, while I do have academic training and qualifications and so on, a lot of my work has been with real life communities uh, doing on the ground activism around questions of openness in India and South Asia. And for us, open access was never about academic publishing and ivory tower research. Mm. Uh, for example, in India, the, uh, one of the first movements that makes the right to information possible within a country like India was the principles of openness. Um, and we've been looking at more and more concerns around openness and authorship rather than openness and research. So of course the academia, which is the de facto knowledge industry that we have, is a site where the anxieties are the most visible but it would be perhaps a mistake to close it down only to speaking about academia. Mm. And I think it, it's the, it, is, it is exactly the kind of separation I want to hint at that oftentimes when within academia we sit down and talk about open access debates, we turn them into debates around data and information and 
We forget people like Aaron Schwartz who died because they were fighting certain kinds of battles. You forget the life of people in India who really do not get access to resources which are authored by the state, which are funded by the public resources, but they are not made available because they have tie-ups with one of the sponsors of this particular event. And so that data is completely on proprietary hardware and software, and it's not going to be easily available. And for me, the, the spectrum of openness has to be kind of placed back into the lived reality, rather than merely talking about research publications and books and how do you make it available, because whether we like it or not as academics, the world seems to survive really well without our research academic publications and books. Yeah. But that there is a whole range of data sets which are actually more important to the lived practices of people. And so I would, I would urge not, not to dismiss any of the uh, openness initiatives which I'm a part of in terms of bringing out new kinds and hybrid forms of publishing, but, but urge to kind of not make this separation between um, data and people or data and reality because they have very direct implications on each other in very, very strange and unexpected ways. And that's something that I still want to hold on to. Can you maybe um, um, exp uh, um, explain that again? So what, if you say you open access in the Western world, obviously, <clears throat> it's very much about academics. So where w would you actually place the difference? Would you say, in, is it data sets? Is it... Uh, I, I would say information, right, and, and put it at data. I mean, uh, one of the cases that we have been fighting in India over the last two years has been this really peculiar thing where uh, if you don't know this, we are a poor country, right? Let's get it out of the window to begin with, uh, which means that while we do have a lot of intellectual infrastructure, universities, academic setups, and so on, um, there is very little access to textbooks, right? Basic textbooks which, need, which are needed to be taught in classrooms. So in Delhi University, there is a photocopying shop which prepares something which is called course sets, where they take up all the texts which are prescribed in your curricula, and they photocopy those texts, and then make it available at really cheap prices to students who otherwise cannot afford to buy those texts, do not have digital access, and cannot go to school without those textbooks. Um, in, in late 2011, Routledge, Oxford University Press, and Cambridge University Press uh, sue this one particular tiny photocopying shop which makes a living of about 500 euros a month uh, with a sum of 1.2 million euros saying you are doing copyright infringement, right? And you are, you are basically trying to violate our, our ownership of this particular information and data. Now, of course, this is an openness problem. It is also a research problem. But the implications are much larger because if this case actually goes through, and if this MS Rameshwari photocopying shop loses the case, you are suddenly going to face an incredible amount of privatization of education in India, where anybody whose parents cannot afford to buy those textbooks can no longer study in school, period. Mm -hmm. So this separation between the two is sometimes what, what kind of causes me anxiety, and I would want to bring people back into open access debates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cornelius, is there a... Is there a is there a conscious it, with uh, scientists and uh, academics about this? Um, are they living? Are we living in an ivory tower? Th that's uh, um, that's a very complicated question, or, or there, there are a lot of different stances on this, obviously, and there, a lot of academics are very engaged with this um, question of how how accessible um, their research is and how accessible information uh, from scholarly research or scientific research is in general. But um, my experience is that, and that's sort of the, the response um, that, that I uh, made earlier sort of uh, connects, I think, to what Nishant was saying in the sense that um, the narrower definition of open access just applying to scholarly publishing, and that is quite narrow, but that has a lot of sort of complexity um, in it uh, in and by itself. So if we talk about openness in the way that Nishant was, was talking about it, I, I think that's very important, but I also don't really know where to start. It's a very com that's a very complex issue to me, maybe because I'm not really used to um, studying uh, um, uh, openness in this very broad sense of um, what is the societal impact of closing down access to, to information in other contexts, because I very much agree with you, and, and this is also a notion that I've heard from a lot of um, scientists who say, well, 
open access as applied to my research. Who really cares? Because I don't think lay people read any of my stuff anyway. Um, it, it would be very difficult for them to, to uh, understand or work with the results of my research. Um, so that's, that's, um, uh, that's something that's sort of under debate. Um, now, if we focus for just a second, and I, I want to do that, um, on open access publishing uh, and, and talking about um, uh, open access really to scholarly publications, that in and by itself is a very complex landscape. So um, a lot of the time when we t talk about open access publishing and, and how um, publications should be more open, we're talking about large publishers. There's a, a consortium of basically four very powerful, very large scale science, technology, med medicine publishers who control the, the um, vastest share of the, of the publishing market in fields where the subscription fees for scholarly journals are extremely high, and those are generally technical or medicine or, or hard science fields, not, not the humanities, because in the humanities, publishing by comparison is extremely cheap by comparison to these <laughs> fields. So these publishers make extremely high, have extremely high profit margins, have enjoyed extremely high profit margins in the past. They make a, an extreme lot of money, and they make that money from university libraries, which are publicly funded, um, and where a, a, a dysfunctional situation has emerged, where the libraries pay for the publications, which the scientists demand, but the scientists are unaware of the costs of these publications, because while they publish in these journals, they don't pay for them themselves. They do the peer reviewing for free, they submit their articles for free to the journals, the journals are then sold back to the libraries, that's what you were talking about, that the, the public pays twice, and this has gone on for a long time, it's cost the taxpayer huge volumes of money, it's made these four um, uh, major publishers and some not so major ones very rich, ex extremely rich. Um, I think that the margins, profit margins in scholarly publishing are the highest margins in the entire media business in terms of profitability. And, and um, uh, so, um, but just because I was saying it's an uneven picture. So if we now turn our attention to small scale humanities um, uh, or university presses which publish books about English literature, then obviously those are not making billions of dollars. They're not global businesses and so forth. That's an entire different publishing landscape. So talking about open access monolaterally and applying that to all fields, disciplines, national contexts, etc., cetera, um, is, is a very um, sort of Un unfair thing to do. It's unfair because then very often these small presses come under attack because people go to them and say, well, you're not being open and you're not, uh, you're not promoting, promoting openness enough, when really their profit margins may be very small. They produce actual physical books rather than just uh, electronic uh, articles, which is the norm in the science, uh, technology, and medicine areas. Um, so they're under a very, in a very different situation, and they struggle uh, quite a bit, some of them at least, with um, having to digitize all of their products, um, and then in some cases also having to make uh, available um, the publications uh, openly um, because somebody has to pay in the end. And that's, that's perhaps my, my um, uh, sort of um, argument that I want to nudge into the, into the discussion. When we talk about open access in this restricted context of academic publishing, the question is who carries the, the cost and in what form and at what end of the publication process. Because the successful models um, and I hope I'm not boring everybody out of their minds right now with this. Um, the, the successful models in open access publishing, which seem to work, where things are open, golden uh, road access open, are those where the author pays at the beginning of the publication process. So somebody always pays. And, and um, there haven't been any, I've been involved very strongly actually in one open access publishing um, platform that didn't actually have any real business model rather than we put things out there, but it doesn't work because we have nobody, we had nobody who we could pay to do the actual technical labor, who run the actual infrastructure. I mean, virtually nobody. We parceled out some yeah. resources. Yeah, but it's very that, difficult. That's a very important point we have here, um, but that's always forgotten or a lot of Sorry. times forgotten in the open access <clears throat> movement is that uh, you think that, okay, the researcher wrote the book and now it's open access, we don't need any money, you know, that you can just publish it, the book's already there. Um, now, um, with our lab at the uh, hybrid publishing lab at the Leuphana, we researched that a bit, and it's actually not true. I mean, 
at the beginning you think those author processing fees that are usually about 6,000 to 10,000 euro are ridiculous, but actually they are not. Um, to produce a quality, there has to be one or two lectureship editorial processes. You need a clearing of rights if you want to print some pictures. Um, <clears throat> you need somebody to set the text in a nice readable way. You need a technical person that makes sure they get published on the different digital platform formats. By now, uh, publishing becomes really confusing. Of course, you can just publish in PDF, but you know that we all turn to read more on tablets and so on, so on, so on. So um, to do this in a professional way or in a quality way that is an equivalent to a book that needs actually a lot of work and what I find with digitalization is that this sort of labor a lot of time gets forgotten and open access is doesn't mean that you can publish a book for free. I think this is a problem. Now David, you once wrote um, a sort of uh, a sarcastic piece about uh, open access movement um, and you have a point there um, I would like to focus on now which is in the beginning, we were all talking, well, Cornelius mentioned it, uh, you mentioned the case in India, and I mentioned it that um, with education, people make real money, and they make a lot of money, and um, we didn't like that. So when the open access movement came along, we thought, wait, that's a great way out of there. Uh, we get our education back. Now, um, you wrote a piece that explains a little bit why this is not the case. Uh, can you maybe elaborate on that? So if you're interested, the um, parody is called the Swansea Declaration on Open Edutainment. Mm. And essentially what I was trying to do is to draw attention uh, to who is it that's pushing so forcefully for open access, particularly in the educational context. And it's companies like Google, Microsoft, Apple, the usual suspects. And these people are not pushing. And of course others for you know, very good, uh, public-minded, uh, democratic reasons as well, but the, the, the dollars generally come from these big corporations, and they're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, of course. They see a potential business model, and that business model really should be put in context of um, a speech, some testimony given by Alan Greenspan to uh, Congress in 1971, where he was asked about the future of the American economy, and he said, well, you know, information and data are the oil of the 21st century, right? All of these organizations that generate data, particularly governmental organizations, but also educational, if that were freely available, then other companies could pick it up, repackage it, and sell it. So there's a whole political economy uh, related to this open access question. Of course, you know, we shouldn't simplify you know, the open access debate. As Cornelia said, in different national contexts, it's playing out in different ways. That's very important to understand. But I think we must understand that you know, it isn't just wholly you know, a, a, a moral good, right? There are political economic forces behind it as well. And if we think in terms of you know, the educational industry, uh, with a, in the UK, for example, the turn towards very high fees education, there's been a lot of talk about how open education and free data and free information can sort of obliterate away the universities. And I think this is very naive. I think it's highly unlikely to happen. What you will have is get maybe you know, two classes of uh, student, those that can afford to go to the real universities and those that cannot. And this raises very interesting questions about you know, what is it that our universities are for and what is it that our universities are supposed to teach? Because of course, certain kinds of practices, and here I'm thinking particularly of those kind of critical, citizen-minded uh, practices, very much linked to the notion of the enlightenment that the humanities generate, rely on very close interaction with their students, right? That kind of interaction gets lost in these massive um, open uh, core systems uh, called MOOCs, uh, incidentally. Do you want to say something? Because um... I shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you should. <laughs> you will reply. Do we have questions out there? Or does, yeah, there are some. Do you want to grab that? Um, one question, um, isn't the whole discussion about open access not a bit um, old maybe? Because um, the first thing you've said, it's a technical discussion and it really is. Um, but the main problem isn't um, the accessibility of the um, science papers, 
in my opinion, the main problem is um, are things like copyright in uh, scientific texts, because you um, you write a book, and this book is um, for 70 years under the ban of a copyright, and you can't publish it um, that free like you maybe want. And um, I think that would be the main problem. So if you make a technical uh, patent, so um, you got 12 years um, security on. And for a book, it's by uh, 70. Um, right, yeah. So um, I think what I had in mind was the, uh, the, the difference between the, the technocratic or, or the, the formalistic stuff, so both the legal and the technical and a few other aspects which are all sort of um, practical issues that need to be fixed, which are in some cases very difficult to fix, but still things that need to be fixed um, versus the wider, if you may, philosophical or, or um, ethic debate about openness and access to information that, that we have in relation to uh, richer and poorer countries, that we have in relation to richer and poorer researchers uh, and students inside of countries. So we have all these um, uh, very uh, um, major questions of equality and inequality raised in, in relation to the whole open X, open anything. Um, discussion that's going on. Uh, there's so much, you know, open education, open data, open access, open, you know, there, there's a blooming of terms that have something to do with openness and they sort of suggest to us that everything is become, uh, becoming more, more uh, equal and more uh, fair somehow, but of course we realize that that's not the case and uh, I'm, I was surprised that Nishan didn't um, raise this one example of open data practices in India where people uh, make huge profit margins of, of uh, uh, buying or selling real estate I think it was in that case, and that certain classes are obvi obviously privileged by using digital platforms that give you information about real estate prices when the majority of the population doesn't have any access to these kinds of... Uh, so, but what you were saying, uh, copyright issues generally and copyright issues in relation to scholarly publishing, um, that's, a, that, that's a big issue as well, but that's, it's a technical issue to the extent that the question is, are the policy makers... Um, what is their stance on it? What about the academic authors? What is their stance on it? Um, but, you know, that seems to me to be an issue that's been under debate for a long time and where change has happened and, and is happening. But um, historically, the model of, of uh, disseminating scholarly information in the way that it's been done up to now, that was a good model at some point because of the fact that dissemination worked differently. It, it's probably not the best model anymore. It's probably not in the interest of the public that, um, that um, uh, uh, scholarly research is not disseminated more broadly because of the way that it's practically done. But I see that as something that's soluble. That's the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the uh, problems that you raise exist, but I don't think that's going to stay the same for a very long time. There's already the push for making stuff that's directly funded through third-party uh, third money to make that uh, more immediately accessible. There's more and more contractual things that as an author, as a scholarly author, if I contribute something, if I receive certain types of funding, I have to make it available. So there's going to be more push from policymakers for this, and then that problem's going to be solved at some point in the near future. Sorry, kind of a long answer. So I think the issue of copyright, of course, is an interesting one, an important one, but there's no simple causality here. Yeah. There's no one simple problematic. We, here at this panel, we're talking particularly about open access, but of course there's an entire constellation around open access, and copyright is one of those, um, that is related, again, to, I think, to a political economy, right? Copyright generates income, it generates rich people and profits. As Cornelius was saying, the academic publishers in the journal industry, they have profit rates of 38%, which is very, very high, right? It's as high as Apple. You know, this is, this is crazy. And no surprise that it's so high. Academics write the papers for free, essentially. Then they pass over their copyright. Then academics do the free labor of peer reviewing it. And then academics get the libraries to subscribe, right? So it's an amazing model for generating huge you know, factories of profit. I don't think necessarily that just reducing copyright will solve this issue of open access at all. And of course, you know, we can look at, for example, um, very laudable uh, solutions suggested, for example, by the Creative Commons and by uh, the free software movement, where you can use different licensing systems um, to kind of open up this material. 
and also, you know, related to copyright, and probably we won't have much time to talk about it, but I just want to kind of signpost it. The whole question of digital rights management as well, I think, is a hugely important one. And if we think about our existing practices in relation to texts, now we download them. These companies like Amazon can just delete them from our uh, Kindles without our permission. I think there's a whole constellation. Uh, yeah, yeah, short question. My, uh, my name is Daniel Dietrich from the Open Knowledge Foundation. And um, um, I, I'm, I'm happy that you raised that point, um, Nishad, um, that we shouldn't be naive by putting an open sticker on being at access to uh, scientific publications or to data or to whatever, and then think that this will kind of save the world. Uh, yes, it's obviously a, a much more political question how we as a society organize access to water, infrastructure, and education. Um, but, but being an open data evangelist myself, I, I would like to ask you the question, how can we uh, prevent that what, what happened to the open access movement with all these watered down versions of golden open access would happen to the other movements that, that, that are trying to push um, yeah, open data or open education and these, these other struggles that we're in. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I, I will, I'll try to be very brief and I'll say that of course we don't have the answer. If we had the answer we wouldn't be sitting here on a panel trying to discuss this. Um, but there are three things that perhaps also pick up from the earlier question, is to not, again, reduce open data to data and information sets, and perhaps try and look at, as, as David, I think, very beautifully says, an entire constellation of things which are around it, right? So three axes that we have been kind of dealing with are questions, axes of authority, authorship, and authenticity. These are three things which are very embedded in the very definitions of what can be opened up, right? So at some, con it, in, at some points in history or in some points in the life of data, it is possible to open up authorship like Wikipedia did it, for example, where you are dismantling the entire historical structure of this single author who has ownership which can be transferred from, from one person to the other, right? Uh, as, like, if, you, if you're interested more in this, my friend and colleague in Bangalore, Lawrence Liang, has this incredible essay called A Brief History of the Internet in the 13th and the 14th century where he looks at the construction of Chaucer, the father of modern English poetry, and what went into the construction of authorship and why authorship was suddenly necessary to be attributed to a text of a certain kind. Um, the second question, and I think this is incredibly useful for all of us who also teach in classrooms, is questions of authenticity. There is this very strange idea that knowledge that we produce as individual scholars and authors is actually authentic in nature, that it doesn't seem to borrow or plagiarize from any other natural resources, but that it, it can be tied down to me, right? The whole question of digital replication, I mean, one of the concerns of digital rights management is actually around that question, about this data being replicated and nobody making money out of it, so to speak. But so the questions of, questions of authenticity, can you kind of open that particular debate around? And that completely dismantles the existing structures of citations, of library ships, of who is going to be the vanguard of knowledge, and so on and so forth. Um, and the third is the question of authority. I mean, let's not try to fool ourselves into thinking that just because uh, now everybody speaks English in some form or the other and everybody has the internet, we are all doing like open access data in a similar form. It is the same hardcore feminist argument that was made in the 1990s about the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York that 90% of the painters represented in that museum were men and 90% of the subject of painting were women. Right? And, and if you look at the ways in which MOOCs are being designed right now, the ways in which universities, universities are trying to use the notion of openness to brand themselves, uh, to privatize education in emerging economies because that's where the new students are going to be, you start kind of getting this really sinister feeling about how important openness is. Maybe we should just close everything down, okay. including the university. <laughs> yeah? Um, but, uh, I mean, not, not, be, not to be facetious, but the idea that for us at least the three uh, things we are hammering away are, the, to repeat, just authority, authenticity, uh, and authorship, and trying to kind of look at what are the alternative models, sometimes looking at, and it's easier sometimes coming from countries like India where there is a lot of community-based knowledge which is not subject to these kinds of structures. Right? It's highly possible, even now, for me, a very, very urban yuppie Indian, to go into India and find out 
things which belong to the school that my grandmother said so, and the university of we have always known, and that there are these kinds of data sets which are available, which might give you new ideas about the ecologies and ecosystems within which data can, sets can be made open. Hi. Um, I studied anthropology and I love my department, but it's very, very small, and I guess they discovered the internet two years ago. Um, <laughs> Is there, are there recipes or advices how to push uh, the department more to the openness direction for students or young PhDs? Ooh. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> well, the push really is coming from the research councils, I think, and from the European Union. So universities slow, are slow-moving creatures. I mean. So it's very easy to get very annoyed by universities. I think, first and foremost, you can do it by your own actions, right? How you choose to publish and what you publish is a very good way of, you know, performing a kind of leadership role in terms of these issues. Um, but I don't think that, as I've said previously, I don't think open access in and of itself is necessarily enough. I think we also need to critique these concepts and, and provide, you know, critical concepts for thinking about, you know, the issues raised. Um, but... Some departments have found one way of moving forward on this is to have a resolution in the department, and you might want to suggest that to your department head. So we have two more questions, but only five minutes left. So if you would pose your question really, really quickly. Uh, okay, very quickly. As far as I understood from the discussion, um, what publishers did was um, selecting, producing, and distributing uh, knowledge in a way, and that's something that's reorganized now and that we can like do in another way. Um, but the problem uh, I face is also that um, if you want to get a job, uh, it's more important, I mean, at least as a scholar in the humanities, uh, a book that nobody reads that is uh, published at a reputed publisher is way more important than 1,000 blog articles or an e-book or a PDF. And my question would be, what are the approaches? What do you think about um, how can we kind of devalue this reputation economy, to pose it very short? <laughs> um, the most honest answer from my uh, experience is you can't. You really can't. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, this might not um, um, stay the same forever, but uh, I don't see, even with the uptake of, of blogs, uh, for example, I don't see them as fulfilling the same function as traditional publishing. That's just not happening. Those people who are successful using blogs as a scholar are using it to self-promote, they're using it to point to their publications, using it for all sorts of things. So I don't see the, the function um, for, for scholarly reputation of these traditional formats going away. But uh, I have to say, um, publishers are moving fast and um, they already, like even all those really important reputational publishers have open access available if you pay. Uh, an author processing fee. There was another question. Yeah. <coughs> uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a comment, uh, uh, a comment uh, connected to that. Um, from the perspective, from the perspective of a young researcher, I really like to publish open access. There are open access journals, but it's uh, as you said, it's a problem of the reputation. When I like don't publish in a journal that is listed in Thomson Reuters Science uh, Citation Index, I won't be recognized by my colleagues and I won't be like uh, well evaluated for a job. And so the problem here lies within academia itself and the, and the way it evaluates um, the scholars actually. Right, very quickly, a very practical solution to that is to publish in your high profile international journal and then put a preprint on your website. And then you get the best of both worlds, I think. Okay, since we thank you very much for being here, I think we're um, leaving it here. I hope um, you got a little sense how confusing and how important at the same time open access is and the digitalization of our education. And uh, yeah, please continue to engage. <laughs>